Most episodes of Software Engineering Daily are interviews with an expert about a technical software concept. Occasionally, I write editorials, and I also record these editorials as a podcast. The first editorial was about 10 philosophies for engineers. The second one was about how poker relates to software engineering. And the third one was about music and software engineering. Today's episode is called You Are Not a Commodity. Since it is a departure from the normal format, I'm releasing it on a weekend, and there are no ads on this episode. If you don't like it, don't worry. On Monday, the Software Engineering Daily episode format will be back to normal, to its usual highly technical rigor. In any case, please send me your feedback. I want to know if you like this type of episode or if you dislike it. Send me an email, send me a tweet. With that, let's get to this episode. You are not a commodity. You are not a commodity. Software engineers are often trapped in careers that consist entirely of software maintenance rather than building new products. This episode outlines why big companies usually underpay engineers and offer unrewarding work, and this episode also suggests strategies for engineers who are looking to escape that commodification. How you became a commodity. During the Industrial Revolution, people began working on assembly lines. At the assembly line, workers were given narrow roles. The assembly line is a resilient, consistent tool for manufacturing because the roles of each worker are so well-defined that the worker can be easily replaced. Assembly line workers are so easily replaced as to effectively be a commodity, a raw good to be bought and used up. For the worker, becoming a commodity is unpleasant, But there are not good alternatives to working on assembly lines. At least, there were not in the past. You could not simply quit the assembly line and go start your own. The Industrial Revolution brought massive progress by narrowly defining these worker roles. But individual workers suffered. Society progressed quickly because industrialists could leverage the commodity workers and have more predictable output, but this did come at the expense of the individual workers. This method of production continued into the information age. Early computer systems were hard to operate. Individuals did not have much leverage. You needed teams of people to be closely managed in order to accomplish significant tasks. Today, computer systems are easier to operate. Individual engineers can build lifestyle businesses. Small teams can build products as big as WhatsApp. Everyone has more leverage not just industrialists who are in charge of giant assembly lines. Most software engineers take a career path that gives them as much leverage as the commodity workers of the assembly lines of the past. We conform ourselves to the unpleasant tasks that are needed by large corporations. So if you agree with that proposition, that the world is trying to commoditize you, why should you care? Is this bad? Does this even matter? If you take one thing away from this post, make it the following. It is now easy to build your own assembly line. This is a dramatic change. The economics of the big company do not reward the lower level workers, and today it's easy for a skilled engineer to opt out of the poorly compensating corporate machinery. There are clear strategies to getting out of this hamster wheel. It's now time to build your own assembly line. 20 years ago, the tools within a large software corporation were much more sophisticated than anything that you could buy as an individual. But then Amazon Web Services reduced the cost of server provisioning and management from $50,000 for a single machine to essentially free. The excellent free infrastructure provided by AWS led to excellent free software like Dropbox and Trello and Slack. And these cheap tools integrate with each other, and they empower the individual to be massively productive. When these SaaS tools like Dropbox and Trello and Slack get combined with each other, they get built into even better tools, and the quality of available software compounds at a staggering rate. Cloud computing triggered this massive improvement in public software that individuals and small teams can now build a tech stack with, And the tech stack that you can build with cloud computing software is often even more effective than the software stack of a big corporation. 
Big corporations are tightly coupled to their tools, and they cannot take advantage of the rapidly compounding software quality that people outside of a giant corporation can. If you work on a small team or by yourself, you are free to mix and match tools however you see fit. Software tools are the means of production. They're the equivalent of the assembly lines of the 1900s industrialists, and access to these means of production have become decentralized. In fact, the entire economy has become decentralized in a way that benefits individuals and small teams. It's not just the means of production, but it's also distribution and contracting and payments and access to domain expertise and every other aspect of business. The advantages of big centralized corporations are now available to individuals and small teams. And one example of this that I think is perfect is Fiverr. Fiverr is one example of service providers that an individual or a small team can use for leverage. Fiverr contractors can provide cheap help with accounting or WordPress or audio and video editing or marketing or other supplementary work that big companies would hire contractors to do. They might also hire full-time employees to do this type of work, but as an individual, you can hire Fiverr employees to do small tasks for your business. For example, I would not be able to run this podcast without a Fiverr contractor that I employ to edit the podcast episodes for about 10 or 15 bucks an episode, which is a great deal. A large corporation needs recruiters and hiring managers employed to vet potential employees. Instead of the time-consuming interview process of the full-time employment pipeline that large corporations need, if you use a service like Fiverr, you can just use the reputation system of each candidate, which speaks for itself, and interviewing the candidate becomes more of a formality because you can just look at their past work. Fiverr is useful for tasks that are not complicated but require focus and consistency. For more complex work, you can use a service like Upwork, which is great for software development if you want to contract out software development. These services fulfill the dream that was believed about offshoring software development in the 1990s. You can get high-quality, cheap outsourcing. Fiverr and Upwork put downward pressure on the cost of contractors, but software businesses also need full-time workers. Building a full-time engineering workforce has also become cheaper. This sounds counterintuitive to anyone who has heard of the peak talent war of tech, but each individual engineer has so much leverage today that you actually need dramatically fewer engineers to ship good software. You also don't need to pay for real estate to house those engineers. In the past, a team of software engineers needed a physical place to work together in. That's no longer the case. Docker, TopTal, HashiCorp, there are plenty of companies that have moved to remote work, and this is enabled by those tools like Slack and Trello and other collaboration tools. These remote companies report increased transparency and improved communication. Remote employees must leave a trail of finished work to let themselves be audited, and this is not difficult for employees who are actually getting work done. Chat logs and GitHub commits are the perfect way to leave a trail of work that has actually been done. At a large company, the productivity of an engineer might be reduced if you have to interface with project managers or business development people or marketing people. Small companies benefit from the fact that engineers have to understand the big picture. Business, design, sales, product development... An engineer has to understand all of these things if the engineer is in charge of the entire project or if the engineer is part of a small team. There was a great episode on software engineering radio recently about Fred George's concept of programmer anarchy. Fred George is this engineering manager that took this idea of a programmer of the programmers having to do everything to the extreme. And here's a quote from this concept of programmer anarchy. At the start of the day, the programmers choose their own work during daily stand-up meetings. There are no PMs. There are no iteration managers or BAs or QAs or testers or managers of programmers. All the normal rules of managing software development in a professional environment are gone. This is on the basis that formality and rules are constraining to creativity and productivity. Programmer anarchy runs on the concept that with no managers to give power to their programmers to go ahead and develop... 
programmers go ahead and take total responsibility for the success of each project in a form of self-organized anarchy. So that's the end of this quote about programmer anarchy. The success of programmer anarchy indicates higher leverage among engineers. The role of an engineer can subsume all other roles. Programmer anarchy works today because the tools are better and the practice of software engineering is more widely understood. Engineers don't have to spend as much time writing boilerplate code, so the leftover time can be spent thinking about the product at a higher level, which yields business value. Understand this fact. The leverage of the individual engineer is big, much bigger than it's ever been before, and the leverage of the small team is massive. The biggest examples of this are things like WhatsApp and Instagram, where you have these super small teams that build billion-dollar companies. I don't think this is really an accident, or it doesn't have anything to do with the genius of the people at these companies. It's more the fact that they realize that the tools they're using give them so much leverage, and then they take advantage of that leverage. How to build. If you are building a business alone or with a small team, the classic advice that you hear from places like Y Combinator is, make something people want. Another piece of advice is live in the future and build what seems interesting. These are good pieces of advice for the brainstorming phase of building products, but many engineers have never built a prototype before. Engineers who have done maintenance for their whole career cannot imagine how to go from an idea to a usable product. If you've spent most of your career at a large corporation, you might be handicapped by a reliance on internal tooling and workflows. You might be handicapped by the fact that you've always been told what to do, or you've been told at a high level what to do, and you have the freedom to, in to implement that at a lower level. If you want to build a product end-to-end, -end, you have to devote some time to getting decent at the ideation step and the process of building a product at every area of the stack. You have to learn to prototype, which means building new programs from nothing. And this is more of an emotional and a psychological journey than a technical challenge. We all remember the pleasure of building software from scratch. Whether our first piece of software was a simple game or a calculator app, we remember that feeling. Why do we ever stop building new stuff? It's because our corporate software jobs normalize the idea of doing software maintenance all day and then going home to watch Game of Thrones. If you have just escaped a corporate job, you can start with one to two months of reskilling. You probably have some money saved up. It might even be worth going through a coding boot camp. We've done so many episodes about coding boot camps on Software Engineering Daily, and the thing that stands out about coding boot camps, like Hack Reactor, seems to be that they instill their engineers with the skills and the necessary workflows to build projects by themselves or with small teams. Even if you have a computer science degree, there's no shame in going to a coding boot camp. Universities teach theory. Boot camps teach execution. Whether you attend a boot camp or lock yourself in an apartment with a plural site subscription, the reskilling process can iron out the sad past life of the software maintenance engineer, allowing for a rediscovery of that creative joy that probably made you fall in love with programming in the first place. This means getting away from the thick industrial languages like Java and C Sharp and going deep on a set of tools that allow for rapid prototyping, like React and Node.js or Ruby on Rails. These things are great for prototyping and building your own end-to-end -end web app. An engineer who is interested in data science and machine learning can spend time learning TensorFlow or Spark. There are countless tutorials online. I recommend DataQuest. It's an online school for data science and machine learning. Building an entire prototype and deploying it to DigitalOcean or Heroku is a really satisfying experience, especially after you spend several years on the software assembly line, only understanding small parts of whatever giant application or corporation you're working at. The first time you type in a URL of a web app that you built and deployed entirely yourself provides a rush that no six-figure programming job can provide. With enough practice, building your own software becomes easy. 
the challenge then becomes what to build. After acquiring the requisite skills to prototype, it is easier to dream up new product ideas without the self-doubt that you won't be able to bring such a product to market. Once you have the requisite skills to build a software product, what do you build? There's been a lot written about this brainstorming process. There's Paul Graham essays and books like The Lean Startup that are useful guides to thinking up an idea for software that generates money. After spending a long time in a corporation, your ability to think up fresh ideas might have become weak. As a programmer trying to think up new ideas, it is easy to become discouraged and think that everything has been invented already. One strategy for overcoming this mental atrophy is to look at the giant markets that would be too big to capture, even if all of the programmers in the world were pursuing them at once. Machine Learning Plus X is one of the safest routes to take if you are building a software business and don't know where to begin. Futurist Kevin Kelly says, The business plans of the next 10,000 startups are easy to forecast. Take X and add AI. End quote. Every business needs machine learning applications in the same way that every business needed a website in the 1990s. At the same time, most developers are afraid of machine learning because it sounds intimidating. Of course, web development sounded intimidating in the 1990s. When developers actually try out the available machine learning tools, they find Scikit-Learn and other tools like this to be accommodating, just like Ruby on Rails is for web development. They're not that intimidating. Even if you build a machine learning product that nobody needs, you will have to learn machine learning in order to actually do that. If your first product fails, you might be able to reuse some of the code in your next machine learning product. Eventually, you'll find some machine learning product that somebody needs. There's really just so much opportunity in that space that it's kind of inevitable. Hardware is another field with wide opportunity. Like machine learning, hardware also sounds harder than it is, because hard is even in the name. Just as Spark and Scikit-Learn are simplifying machine learning, cheap hardware like Tessel and friendly software frameworks like Johnny5 are simplifying hardware prototyping. IoT is the place to start for new hardware developers. Every major cloud provider and chip producer is investing heavily in IoT. Since giant companies are competing to provide the best IoT platform, individual developers can take advantage of that competition and those low prices that it costs to get onboarded as a user of those IoT platforms. For the developer, everything is cheap in IoT land. Companies like GE, Amazon, and Microsoft are fighting to capture market share and they're willing to lose plenty of money bringing developers onto their platforms. They're fighting for that market share because the opportunity is so big. Common customers for IoT products are factories, farms, warehouses, and other industrial businesses. These sectors have huge piles of money to spend, and they're becoming more tech-savvy, they're willing to experiment. There's plenty of opportunities in the IoT space if you're willing to study these specific sectors. Regardless of what product you build, every enterprising software engineer should keep in mind one fundamental trend. The biggest pair of economic forces working in your favor are cloud computing on the supply side and small devices on the demand side. These supply and demand forces cannot be understated. Small devices like mobile phones and IoT need new, unique applications. This trend has been going for about a decade, and it's not going to slow down anytime soon. Customers will pay money for these applications, and cloud computing means that providing those applications to the end user is really cheap. It's much cheaper than is intuitive for the end user. And as the developer, you get to capture that arbitrage between what the customer thinks it is worth it to pay, and what it actually costs to vend those type of applications. 
This trend is going to impact whatever area of technology you decide to work in in some way. In developing countries, the demand for unique smartphone apps is even more acute than it is in the developed world because consumers in developing countries often don't have a laptop or a desktop computer. The only computer they have is a smartphone. So imagine how much different your day-to-day life would be if you did not have a laptop, if your only computer was a smartphone. These developing countries also have poor connectivity in many cases, which makes the demands of consumers different from developed countries. These places are also less saturated with technologists, so they are ripe for people looking to study the local markets and understand the pain points of consumers in order to develop applications specifically for those consumers. There are also plenty of other smaller burgeoning sectors than the big sectors that I've described. There's the gig economy, there's virtual reality, there's Docker, cryptocurrencies, plenty of the things that we've covered in Software Engineering Daily. After studying any one of these sectors in detail, it becomes clear just how much technological growth can be realized in the next few years and how few people are putting themselves in a position to capture it. And that's really why I'm recording this episode. The hardest battle to fight here is understanding that you as an engineer should build something. Once you internalize that fact and acquire the necessary skills to prototype, the process of building is a fun exploration, even if you fail along the way. Counter arguments. Now that we have discussed how to build an assembly line, let's address some of the counter arguments that favor being a commodity employee of a large corporation. The compensation counter argument corporations pay lots of money. The average employee at a corporation actually realizes a small portion of the value created by her work. Most of the money goes to the people who created the assembly line, not the people who maintain it and build on top of it. Clearly, individuals who create an assembly line are rewarded more handsomely. And in the post, I have this chart that I've referred to before that Business Insider put together of how much revenue tech companies make per employee. And Apple, for example, makes almost $2 million per employee. That means that the engineers are generating even more money for the company. So if Apple is making $2 million per employee, why does that make sense? Why does it make sense for an employee to work at Apple when they're generating $2 million for the company and probably capturing 200,000 maybe? That's not to say that the only thing you should be concerned with is money. It's just that if your argument of staying at a big corporation is that they pay you a lot, well, Wouldn't it make more sense to just start your own? The loyalty counter-argument. Someone has to do this work. Employees often feel a sense of guilt when they leave a large company. Their work is so important to the company's health. How will the company manage to run without you if you leave? If your work is so important to the giant corporation that you work for... That probably means that you could go to your manager right now and ask for the biggest raise that is justifiable given the revenue generated by your work. If they don't give you the raise, that means that they won't have trouble replacing you. If the company does give you the raise, that implies that the company could have calculated that your work was more important than your compensation implied. In this case, the company was deliberately paying you less than it could afford. This does not sound like a relationship where loyalty should play a major role in our career calculus. Your relationship to a company is firstly transactional. The company needs to pay you the minimum and extract the maximum. There is room for feelings of loyalty only at the margins of this relationship, and this becomes increasingly true the bigger an organization gets, The more it becomes like an assembly line, the more resilient it gets to losing any one individual member of the company. If a company like Apple is capturing $2 million per employee, it's just destined to be a transactional relationship. 
the employee is not capturing a tenth of the value that they are creating. I mean, what's the average salary at Apple? Probably, I mean, less than two hundred thousand dollars. So that's a tenth of the two million dollars that Apple makes per employee. If Apple makes ten times what the employee makes, it's just simply not a relationship where you should be talking about things like loyalty because the company is leveraging you as an employee, which is fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I see that as a brilliant aspect of capitalism, but it's it's just not one where you should really factor in a really emotional relationship to that type of employer. The stability counter-argument. Large corporations are safe. Corporations present a career ladder that can appeal to a student who progressed comfortably through the linear path of high school and college, where success was simple to plot. The straight path of the engineer to the senior engineer to the staff engineer to the senior staff engineer to the principal engineer to the lead principal engineer to the senior principal engineer, this path is seemingly comfortable. If you do all the work that you are assigned as an engineer, then life is good for you. In the average case, you do great at the company, you naturally rise through the ranks, your salary increases at a linear rate. The thing is, the average case always looks good for a strong engineer. If you're a good engineer, your downside risk is capped in almost any conceivable future. Of course, it is impossible to imagine a world in which engineers are not in high demand, other than catastrophic scenarios. In the hypothetical scenario where a good engineer is not employable, it is likely that something has gone drastically wrong with the economy. I mean, seriously, can you imagine a future where a strong iPhone engineer or a strong web developer is not in high demand? If that's the case, there's just something that has gone wrong with the economy that is so hard to imagine that it's almost impossible to prepare for today. So this fact negates the idea that patiently saving for the future, patiently sitting at the corporation, rising through the ranks in a linear fashion, this the idea that this is safe is negated because, because the idea that it is safe seems to suggest that the contrasting option is unsafe. The contrasting option would be to leave the corporation, build something on your own, and maybe you fail, maybe you succeed, but in any case, it is unsafe. The only cases where leaving a corporation, building something on your own, and failing or succeeding would be hypothetically unsafe are the same types of scenarios that existentially threaten the path of the engineer who proceeds through the career ladder in a linear fashion. So something like nuclear war or giant threats from global warming uh, ruining the economy or some kind of flash crash type of scenario that wipes out everybody's savings. These types of hugely threatening scenarios would be dangerous to everybody, whether you are a a person who goes off on their own and tries to build your new product, or a person who has been sitting at the corporation patiently saving your money. I mean, if you have $200,000 in guns, gold, and Bitcoin saved up from your work at the corporation, is that really going to keep you safe in an economic collapse? I mean, what financial instrument could you keep your money in that would insulate you from global economic collapse? Even if you had $200,000 in guns, gold, and Bitcoin, how would you have the self-sufficiency to properly manage those assets in a time of economic collapse if you've been sitting at a corporation for your entire career? Assuming that the entire economy continues going as swimmingly as it's been going for the past eight years, it doesn't matter whether you stay at a giant corporation or go off on your own. Things are going to be great. And if that changes, if something drastically changes in the economy, it probably won't matter if you are at the giant corporation or out on your own. Your job security is probably fairly limited in that scenario. So, you should embrace the chaos, and the safer investment 
existentially is to train yourself with the ability to invent, the ability to be independent regardless of the circumstances of the economy to the best of your ability. The leverage counterargument. Corporate infrastructure empowers me. Google, Amazon, and Facebook retain their best employees by giving them freedom to invent. The employees who built AWS, or the Like button, or the HoloLens, escaped their commodity status by building something that differentiated them so much as to become a linchpin within the company. Inventing from within a large corporation is the perfect strategy for someone who is stuck at a company on an H-1B, or somebody who is working off student loan debt, or who has a family situation that prevents them from quitting their job. These situations may require you to stay at the giant corporation, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you aren't restricted by immigration constraints or financial constraints, you have much more to gain by building something on your own outside of a company. It raises the stakes and forces you to overcome your fears. When you invent a product on your own, the best case scenario is quite appealing. You get to capture 100% of the product's value, and you get complete creative control, which cannot be understated. Neither of these things are guaranteed when you're inventing at a big company. In fact, the company is likely to take the lion's share of the value that the product creates, and the company is likely to take away some of your creative control. The mentorship counterargument: A corporation is a great place to learn. Corporations can be a great place to learn how to do highly structured work. You are assigned tasks, you learn how to use tools like Git, you learn how to sit through meetings and talk to coworkers. Reviewing code from other coworkers can be educational. It can teach you how to improve the efficiency and the readability of your own code, and the corporation will impose reasonably high standards on your work. These are the good aspects of mentorship. The problem with mentorship at a big corporation is that it might brainwash you in the same ways that it has brainwashed the people who will be your mentors. As an inexperienced employee, your work is likely to be centered around software maintenance. The company will pitch it to you as fresh and exciting because they see you as naive, but you won't be building a new product where you have creative control and true responsibility. And your mentors are likely to try to convince you that software maintenance is just a way of life because they are people who have been doing software maintenance their whole lives and maybe people that aren't willing to leave that world behind. The hardest part of building a new product is deciding that you are going to build a new product and following through with that decision. Corporate mentorship is not going to focus on this idea. If your long-term goal is to build new products, avoid the farce of corporate mentorship. If your goal is a career of software maintenance, then go ahead and do corporate mentorship. Conclusion. Why build? Building new software is the perfect activity for someone who likes art, science, business, or adrenaline. Other activities that provide a similar emotional high include drugs, video games, sex, gambling, browsing Facebook, writing music, painting a picture, international diplomacy, raising children, and skydiving. Human beings get habituated to most of these activities, and we constantly have to raise the stakes. We have a hedonistic need to gamble for more money, or get more intense drugs, or more immersive video games. When we build software companies, the stakes automatically get raised over time. As a user base grows, our financial swings get bigger. Users who love us and love the products that we're building give us praise that is more meaningful than the likes and comments we get as an individual on Facebook. The intellectual challenge is constantly morphing and constantly presenting new problems to solve. Inventing new software is sustainable, it's rewarding, and it's fun. It's an adventure. Many engineers work a job where they feel like a replaceable commodity. They spend several hours a day pondering their existence and doubting their own self-worth. Escape this trap. Don't be a commodity. Build something. <laughs>